What's up, comic book fans? And welcome to Comics Icons. Now, JJ, what they call me. And today, we got a new series with issue one of Helverine by writer Benjamin Percy, who had also penned the last Wolverine series run and the current Ghost Rider Final Vengeance story, as well as the last Ghost Rider series. And during those last runs, he gave us the character known as Helverine after a new evil spirit had merged with Wolverine. But the Weapons of Vengeance story arc ended when the Ghost Rider burned the demon and his host with a damnation stare that imprisoned the creature. But is it still imprisoned? Because if it was out of there, how is it back now? So if you guys are ready for this new four issue miniseries featuring one of the dopest new takes on an old character, then you guys know what time it is. Let's get it. So when this issue kicks off, we get a quick look back at the Weapons of Vengeance story. Kind of a speed run of sorts that starts off with Mephisto and one of his favorite demons known as Bagragul. Bagragul would erect monuments of suffering in Mephisto's honor, both in hell and the world above. And Mephisto would go on to find a vessel for Bagragul in the form of a child that was conceived on a blood altar. That child's name was Bram Straub. And he would go on to reluctantly do the work of Bagragul and Mephisto for years until he had struck a deal with Project Hellfire to free him of the demon Bagragul, who Project Hellfire wanted to use as a weapon. So they found a new host for it in the form of Logan, a.k.a. Wolverine. And once merged with the demon Bagragul, Wolverine became the entity known as Helverine. And now the Ghost Rider was the only thing that could stop him, resulting in the demon getting sealed away in a monument formed by the Hellfire of the Damnation Stair. But truth is, Bagragul had just been healing and hibernating, waiting for his return. And now he's ready to rise again. Then we pick up with a month ago in the far north and on the shore of Hudson Bay, there's a container that arrives the smuggling people. They came with the hopes of a better life, but are instead sold into slavery. Whoever survives would have been transported to basements and clubs and massage parlors. But something else finds them first. Then three weeks ago in upstate New York, there's a small church that's struggling to survive. So during mass, the priest laces the communion wine with drugs, creating a dependency and wild visions that keep the patrons coming back. And several of them have already died, but more just continue to take their place. But now time for confession has come for that priest. Cause Bagger Ghoul's back and the Helverine walks among us once more. But this time, something's different. Then we jumped to two days ago at a burial at Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia for five soldiers that were part of an elite fire team, a highly skilled, extensively trained team that was the most dangerous and effective unit in all the army. But an ambush took out all but one of them. And then as their burial ends and all of the families of these soldiers clear the cemetery, we meet a guy named General Harms who has his men go and dig these soldiers back up. And that all brings us to today, where somewhere in Virginia at a roadside bar, we find Logan just as a group of soldiers rush in and go directly for him with their guns out. Then we go back a day to yesterday, a day after the general had dug those soldiers back up. And deep below the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., there's a new facility called the Pentagon and it's the home of Project Hellfire. And as the general and his men bring in the dead soldiers, he asks the team of scientists if they're ready. But the scientists tell him that they aren't even close to being ready. They're still trying to run diagnostics since they don't know nearly enough about Hellfire energy. But what the general does know is that each of these soldiers cost the country $60 million. And they're not just going to write that off and move on. The bodies of these soldiers are trained weapons that are on their way to rotting, but he kept them clean and formaldehyde so the doctors could do their work. Their muscle memory should still be intact, 
and he wants to move fast on this. So this Hellfire lab is fully devoted to using hell as an arsenal. Iron forged with the blood of sinners and weapons charged with the screams of the damned. Sulfur bombs, burning chains, poison hooks and all sorts of things like that to cause torturous pain all the way down to the soul. They use Hellfire as a weapon and a source of energy. And they use it to try and reanimate these five dead soldiers. And when we jump back to today at that bar in Virginia, as Logan fights off these soldiers, he's hit with multiple trank darts. Twice as much as it takes to bring down a polar bear and then he's restrained before his healing factor can kick in. Then we go back to yesterday at Project Hellfire as the process is completed and these dead soldiers are filled with hellfire. And one of the sciences, the same one that had originally told the general that they were not ready for this process, now expresses her fear to the general. But he attempts to calm her since these soldiers are locked down pretty tight. They'll be able to keep them on lockdown while the scientists run their diagnostics and assess the soldier's ability to fall in line. But then the soldiers begin to wake up and arise and without any hesitation are able to break free of their straps like they weren't even there. Then the general tries to command these soldiers and orders them to stand down, but they don't listen. And one of them grabs one of the scientists and then burns the man's head down to his skull with hellfire from an eye blast. Then this crazy new creation upon seeing the look of death in his hands enjoys it so much that he decides to give himself the gift of death. And just like that, these dumbass soldiers are down to four. <laughs> the general, meanwhile, yells for someone to stop them. But how the hell do you stop four dead soldiers emitting hellfire? And they easily burn their way through this facility and even up to the Pentagon itself, just as a briefing was being given. And when one of the officers tries to put up a fight, one of the freaks bites his damn head off. Sheesh. Then we jump back to four days ago, a couple of days before those soldiers' funeral. And outside of Philadelphia, there's servants of hell that have an extra sense. Like being able to hear the sound of sin. They can taste evil in the air, such as the power of Bagragul. The demon uses darkness as a compass. And as this evil cannibal group dine on sins tonight, Bagagul was hungry too, and he decides to crash their party. This club had met once a month over a decade and ate what they hunted, the poor and the vulnerable, ones that no one would ever miss, but now it was their turn to be hunted. See, something had happened when Bagagul bonded with Wolverine. There was a twinning or a warping, so to speak. Logan was scarred with regret for all of the terrible things he had done, and he had weaponized that guilt. When he lashed out now, he did so with a repentant spirit. And in the same fashion, Bagragul could still bathe in blood and delight in pain while punishing the Punishers. Punishers just like the ones he sensed now. Then we jump back to today with Wolverine now chained up at Project Hellfire, as the General comes in to interrogate him. And when he comes in, he asks Wolverine why he didn't use his powers when they came for him at the bar. But when Wolverine extends his claws, the general tells him that those aren't the powers he was talking about. And then he shows Wolverine a video clip of the Helverine from four weeks ago. But when Logan sees the video, he knows that that ain't him. And he tells the general that. But the general, of course, doesn't believe him. I'm sure Bruce Banner says the same thing when he sees footage of the Hulk rampaging. And then he shows Logan more videos of what Helverine left behind. The carnage in Philly with the Cannibal Club. A serial killer group of truckers in Ohio. A sniper hitting people in Chicago. You killed them all, the general tells him. Then he tells Logan that he's the new head of Project Hellfire. And they're the ones that created the Helverine. They implanted a demonic spirit in Logan and programmed him to hunt. So they know who he is. But Logan tells him that the Ghost Rider took the spirit out of him. He ain't with him anymore. And besides, what the general describes doesn't make any sense to Logan anyway. Bagra Ghoul is the bad guy. He doesn't hunt the bad guys. Then we go back to yesterday at the Pentagon as those Hellfire soldiers continue their rampage and take out everybody that they encounter. The Helverine then shows up 
and he starts fighting these soldiers. And then helicopters arrive and inside they begin to open fire on the Helverine and the Hellfire soldiers rampaging. But one of those Hellfire soldiers uses his chain to grab and pull down one of those choppers, causing a huge explosion around them. As we then go back to Logan's interrogation as he's being shown that video footage of the incident. Then the general tells Wolverine that the demons are still out there right now. They killed more than 50 people in about an hour, burning their way through one of the most secure facilities on the planet. And their weapons had no effect on these soldiers. But the Helverine did, and the general wants to fight fire with fire. So he releases Logan from his restraints, and he asks him for his help. Then Logan asks the general to pull that footage back up again. Back to when the Helverine had gotten blasted by the fire from the choppers and has him slow down the frame rate. And when he does, Logan is shocked at what he sees. It can't be, Logan says to the general. And when the general asks what it is that Logan sees, Logan tells him that it's something that might not mean anything to the general, but it's something he'd recognize anywhere. The tattoo. That's my son. That's a kiddo. But that's impossible. Because he's dead. And that, my friends, is the end of the issue. What's up, comic book fans? And welcome to Comics Icons. Now, JJ, what they call me. And today, we got more Helverine. This time with issue two of this four issue Helverine miniseries. So when this issue kicks off, we're taken back to the North Pole in the past. On that night at the start of the Sabretooth War, when Victor Creed completely dismembered Dakin and left his parts to spell out happy birthday to Logan in the snow. But then sometime after he had died and been buried, the demon Bagar Ghul had sensed him lying in wait an empty vessel that had matched what it recognized from its former host, Wolverine. And although Dakin's body was broken, it had been preserved in the frozen temperatures of the North Pole, almost as if it were a cryo chamber, which allowed for an easy resurrection for the demon, who was already known as a stitcher for sewing together its usual unholy monuments. So Bagar Ghul put the puzzle pieces back together, and then together they became the new Helverine a fiery killing machine compelled to punish evil. And then we pick back up at the underground base of Project Hellfire called the Pentangle as General Harms, the head of the department, walks Wolverine through and shows him around. And as Logan notices them working on one of the Hellfire monsters that was taken down by Helverine, he's just as disgusted with this place as one would expect and even calls it a grave robber's version of Weapon X which is a pretty accurate description. <laughs> and General Harms tries to justify what they've done by telling Logan that these soldiers died for their country and they deserve respect. But then his doctor adds in that they're now soulless instruments and highly skilled weapons called destroyers, which only further makes Logan's point, really. But the general then admits that they have indeed made a mistake and they need Logan's help to retire the rest of the destroyers from the field. But Logan couldn't care less about helping Project Hellfire. The only reason he's here is for his son. So he requests solid files on the destroyers. He wants to use them as bait, since he knows Dakin came after them once before. He can use the files to predict where they'll be when Dakin comes after them again. So as Logan walks off, the general offers to send him a team to help him out. But Logan rejects his team. He hunts alone, he tells him. But after Logan walks away, the general still wants to keep track of Logan. So he uses a hellhound to track Logan's scent so they can keep up with him. And when this is all over, he promises to offer Logan as a treat to the hellhound when he's no longer of use. And then we pick up with Lieutenant Colonel Leon Townsend, who was the sole survivor of the attack that took out the soldiers that Project Hellfire turned into the destroyers. And all he thinks of now are his fallen soldiers that were lost while he sits and drinks alone. He shouldn't be alive and they shouldn't be dead. The ultimate survivor's remorse, basically. And he keeps his TV on just to try and distract him from himself. 
and he's not been able to concentrate on anything but his grief until he sees the report of the attack on the Pentagon and he recognizes the destroyers when leaked cell phone footage is shown on the screen. And then we move over near Chesapeake Bay with Dakin as he tries to understand who he is and what's happening to him. He's not quite alive and not quite dead. No longer himself, but not fully Bagar Ghul either. His memories have been hidden and he still can't quite form words in his mouth nor his mind. But he can feel and what he feels is pain and confusion. So for now, he just hides until he's called again, which happens not long after he's able to target evil in the way a dog uses sense to hunt. And it's a combination of proximity to him and the extremity of the evil that sends him into action. And this time, there's a man on a city bus with enough C4 strapped to him to flatten an entire block. And he's demanding to be driven to the White House. But the Helverine answers the call and the man didn't make it very far. The Helverine was hungry for any and every type of evil right now. And then we pick back up with General Harms as he meets with his boss and tries to explain Project Hellfire's recent mess. And right now she's pissed at him because he's managed to turn fallen heroes into villains. And if he doesn't fix this, then there's going to be hell to pay for him. As we then meet the wife of one of the fallen heroes, as she still tries to cope with her loss. And right now she's still heartbroken, but is then horrified when her dead husband shows up at their home now as a monster trying to get his daughter. The mom, however, is able to convince him to let their daughter go, but he can't really put any words together except mine which he keeps yelling as he tries to come after them once again. But then that's when Wolverine shows up and slices off this dude's dome right in front of his family, which is definitely going to traumatize that kid forever. <laughs> but what's worse is when he does it, the dude's body just keeps coming after them while the fallen head still keeps calling out mine. And as Wolverine tries to question the destroyer about where his other partners are, the woman and her child run out of the house just in time to see the Hellhound and the Project Hellfire soldiers that were following after Wolverine. See, what Wolverine didn't realize was that this fallen soldier named Peter didn't want to hurt his family. He had kept a picture of them inside of his helmet and he just wanted them back. He wanted his life back, but who he used to be, he no longer was. And none of the destroyers were. And now they were starting to understand who to blame for it as the rest of the destroyers show up and take out the Hellhound and the Project Hellfire soldiers. And then later, after Wolverine heals his body from being burnt from taking down the destroyer named Peter, he walks outside to see the mother and child surrounded by dismembered soldiers and the Hellhound. And as he asks the lady what happened here, he realizes that the destroyers have just declared war on the country. And then we pick back up with Dakin as his mind was slowly beginning to wake back up. He even knew his name now, even though he could only see about half of his memories, as if seeing him through a thick fog. And right now he just wants to rest and recover. But it was still more work that needed to be done. So once again, something inside of him was ignited as the Helverine could sense the destroyers as they approached Washington, D.C. in battle formation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the issue. What's up, comic book fans? And welcome to Comic Icons. Now, JJ, what they call me. And today, we got more Helverine. This time with issue number three. So this issue kicks off with a little bit of backstory for General Harms. Before his face had gotten all jacked up. Back when his ugliness was only on the inside. He was commander of a shadow unit that waged wars that took place outside of the media's attention. And the kind of things that they did were unimaginable. He was said in some circles to put the red in red, white, and blue. And it was one mission where he had learned that the families of the enemy were held up in an ancient church and they had hung up a white flag to surrender. But Harms is sadistic ass just tore down that flag and then he tore up those family members. He could care less that they were helpless or that he had just slaughtered innocents in this sacred holy place. 
but in the church was a holy relic up on the altar. It was the skull of a demon slain by a saint. And as he went up to the altar to take the relic, one of the family members thought to be dead pulls a weapon and puts a hole right through the eye of General Harms. Right before the rest of the soldiers put her down. But the bloodshed in this holy place awakened something ancient and foul, and it whispered in Harms' ear as he lay in the pool of his own blood. It told him that as long as he would continue to carry out sacrifices in Hell's name, then he would live. He would be loyal to Hell first and the U.S. government second. So, of course, he accepted and experienced a resurrection of sorts. And then we pick back up with Wolverine outside of D.C. where we had left off with the last issue at the home of one of the destroyers. And as the home burns down, the wife grabs Logan by the wrist to take him into the garage before it too burns down. And in the garage, she gifts Logan with her dead husband's motorcycle. And then we transition over to General Harms' office in the Pentangle. You see, for what he did back at that church, he was actually supposed to face a war tribunal. But the Secretary of State gave him a second chance. Project Hellfire needed a new director. And if he could revive the program and get her some fast results, then he'd get to keep his standing within the government and keep his pension as well. But if he couldn't get his destroyers in line, then he was finished. So he figured he'd solve this problem by fighting Hellfire with Hellfire. But then he gets a call from one of his scientists down in the lab and his presence is requested immediately. And back in the lab, that survivor from last issue that had seen the destroyers on TV and recognized his old teammates, Lieutenant Townsend, he decided to show up at the Project Hellfire lab and use his firearm as his access. I saw what you did on the news. I saw what you did to my crew, he tells the scientists while holding her at gunpoint. They were dead. I watched them die. I watched them buried. But then, in that moment, General Harms enters and tries to settle down the lieutenant. But Townsend lets the general know that he found them by calling in a few favors. But the next call he might make is to reporters. Or, you can help me, he says to Harms. He wants to walk again, and he requests the transformation for himself just like his teammates. Harms, though, admits that this technology is yet to be tested on a living subject. But Townsend is desperate and he doesn't care. He needs this, he tells Harms. Plus, he knows his team better than anybody. And he knows that they'd follow him through the gates of hell. He can lead them and get them in line because they need a commanding officer to guide them and give them a purpose. And for Harms... This is just the type of Hail Mary that he needs to get things back in line, so he welcomes Townsend to Project Hellfire. Meanwhile, Akihiro had come from darkness and now consumed by light, the blazing light of hell itself. But with every passing hour, he was becoming more aware of his rebirth and what he'd become. But when he gripped the handlebars of his bike, he had no control over their direction. At least not yet, but maybe never. He felt like he was wandering through a big black house trying to find his way out. Akihiro was driven to live, but the Helverine was driven only to punish. And the destroyers were out there, so the Helverine would find them. But until they made their next move, Helverine wouldn't be able to sense them, so he found a high vantage point where he could wait. At the top of the Washington Monument, where he could tune in to the frequency of evil like an antenna. Then we switch back over to General Harms as he once again discreetly meets with the Secretary of State. And here she questions Harms about the latest incident at one of the destroyer's homes. But she tells him that they did manage to silence the media for now. But she just came from the White House and notifies Harms that the president does want Project Hellfire to work out. But if they don't manage this situation by morning, he will be accepting the secretary's resignation and Harms would likely disappear into a shallow grave or the bowels of a federal prison. So Harms uses the moment to let her know about his new developments, that the team's former squad leader has joined them and he just needs a little bit more time. But then this secret meeting is interrupted as the destroyers crash the party and go right into attack mode. 
So the general fires off a few rounds to buy some time while he and the secretary jump into his car to pull off. But the destroyers are fierce and unrelenting, and they manage to hold back the car from taking off. While the chick with the metal mouth breaks through the passenger side window, it takes a huge chunk out of the secretary's face, ending her time on this earth. And then as Harms tries to run free, he's wrapped up by chains. But all that violence gave off just the right frequency, which the Helverine was attuned to. And he then shows back up and breaks those chains that bound the general, allowing him to run free while the Helverine takes on the destroyers. And the destroyers were no match for the Helverine, as he takes old Bite down and rips apart her metal mouth and then officially puts her down, leaving only one more destroyer. Meanwhile, though, among all of the weapons that Dr. Spivey had made for Harms was a rifle loaded with holy water ammo. And he had never tested it to know if it would work, but the last destroyer was on the move and the hellfire was about to give chase. So Harms had to act fast and he fired on the Helverine and once hit, the high pitched scream that the Helverine unleashed made dogs bark and children cry in their sleep up to 50 miles away. But someone else heard it too. Someone that had been sniffing the air, tracking the smell of sulfur. The Wolverine, who had arrived just in time to see before him the son that he had lost and now seemingly was in danger of losing again. And as Akihiro finally hits the ground and Logan runs over to his boy to check on him, he's relieved to see that he's still alive. But at Logan's touch, something sparked inside of his son. And it was the demon Bagragul. It had sensed its original host and source of power and wanted to plug back in, which Logan allowed. It was like a father wishing he could swallow the fever of his child, wanting to make their pain his own. But instead of helping his son, Logan actually just doomed him. As the only thing that was keeping Dakin alive was the fuel of the demon Bagragul, who was now gone from Dakin's body leaving Dakin once again lifeless and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the issue. What's up comic book fans? And welcome to Comics Icons. Now JJ what they call me. And today, we got more Helverine. This time with the fourth and final issue of the miniseries. So we kick this issue off at the Pentangle as Lieutenant Townsend comes out of the oven extra crispy. And even though he's been told to wait on General Harms' return before heading out, Townsend is impatient and he's not interested in waiting. And then we pick back up with Wolverine as he holds Dakin's lifeless body. See, without Bagragul, Akihiro couldn't survive and now his body is once again beginning to decay. And now once again, Wolverine was a reluctant host to Bagragul. He had only allowed the transfer because he wanted to take away his boy's pain. And for a brief moment, Wolverine even pondered if it would be better for his son to remain lifeless instead of living with this curse. But with the demon now bonded to Wolverine, he saw, felt, and knew things that didn't belong to him. And he understood that something had shifted with Bagargul. The demon hadn't quite been tamed, but it was altered from his time split with Wolverine. And the compulsion to cut, hack, and kill was still there, but it was reserved for those who were truly evil. In a way similar to the struggle that Logan himself had dealt with his whole life. And Logan knew how hard it was to cage the beast inside, and it seemed like Bagargul has tried to follow suit. But for Logan, this was still a curse. But a curse that Akihiro could live with. And so Logan grabbed his son's lifeless hand and he transferred the demon back to Akihiro. Then we transition back over to the Pentangle as the general arrives back, carrying the body of the Madam Secretary with half of her face chewed off. And he notifies the scientists of the president's threat to shut them down at dawn if the destroyers aren't back under their control. And he wants her to fix the secretary. He wants the power of hell channeled into the leadership of this country. Then we transition back to Wolverine, who's with the now once and again resurrected Akihiro, who can't seem to eat enough food to fill up 
Kind of like he's got a hole inside of him, he tells his pops. But Logan tells him that once he does fill up, then it's time for them to skate and leave all of this behind. But Akihiro refuses. This is his mission, and he needs to see it through. But Logan warns him that if he goes down this road, he could become the next Weapon X. But Akihiro promises not to let that happen. Plus, now that Logan has told him the truth about the soldiers turned destroyers, he can't just walk away. And he's honestly disappointed that Logan doesn't feel the same way. But Wolverine's just worried about Project Hellfire getting their hands on Akihiro. But he tells Wolverine that he feels more in control now. Almost like something within it has been settled. And now he and the spirit understand their place. He even acknowledges that the claws have even changed to Dakin's own claws. And it's no longer pretending that Fang is Wolverine anymore. So Wolverine is now convinced to follow his son back into battle as the Helverine now emerges with Dakin in control and he can sense now that the destroyers have grown again in numbers with the emergence of Lieutenant Townsend. But there's something worse, he tells Logan. Someone worse behind their fire team. And then we transition over to Nationals Park, the baseball field in D.C. As it was Lieutenant Townsend's job to know his soldiers and he knew the last remaining destroyer had lived and breathed baseball. He even packed a ball with them everywhere they went, even the worst battlefields. He called it his lucky charm. It was a homer that he had caught barehanded at a Nationals game. He would even fall asleep listening to broadcasts. And when the lieutenant arrives, he comes face to face with his former teammate. And initially, there's a bit of a standoff between the two. But then the two soldiers embrace which takes us to General Harms as he sits in his office. And not everything has gone according to plan for the General, but he does have the weapon of chaos as he goes for that creepy demon skull. See, Harms had listened to the whispers that came from the demon skull, those greedy, dark whispers that told him what to do next, as he then insists that his doctor begin the change in the secretary. But when she refuses, the general backhands her, knocking her down and taking things into his own hands. And then after some time passes, we pick back up with the general and the newly Hellfire resurrected Madam Secretary, as Hell had now gotten a taste of power and it wanted more of it. It wanted all of it. And if a demon could possess a body, then why not an entire country harms thought? But unbeknownst to him, the Helverine and the Wolverine were hot on his trail and they managed to catch up to the general and disable his vehicle as the Helverine has sensed the greater evil controlling the destroyers while the Wolverine meanwhile decided to take out the Madam Secretary once again by dragging her face on the ground as he drove his motorcycle and then tangling her hair inside of his tire and ending her once more and now leaving the main event of the Helverine versus General Harms. And the general uses this moment to address Bagar Ghoul and remind him of Hell's hierarchy. Just before he fires on him, telling Bagar Ghoul to fall in line. But this time, Akihiro is ready for harms. Although this time, he doesn't really have to fight as Lieutenant Townsend shows up. And while Harms thinks that his destroyers are here for his backup, he's quickly put in line when they wrap up the general with Hellfire chains. The destroyers are here to fight back against Harms and will no longer take orders from them. And they use their Hellfire to put Harms down. And then the Helverine comes in and he hits Harms with his scorpion fatality and he breathes Hellfire right on the Harms, burning them down to a crisp. And then later on, we pick back up at the Pentangle and it's Wolverine's intention to shut this place down permanently. But Akihiro has a better idea. There's no way to guarantee Project Hellfire wouldn't just start back up again, but they can guarantee that the right people are in charge of it and suggest that Lieutenant Townsend run it now, which he happily accepts. Then as father and son ride off, Logan tells his son how proud he is of him, that he made something good out of something so ugly. But now it's time for Akihiro to figure out his next moves on his own, and he bids his father farewell until the next time they meet again. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the issue and this series. 
So what did you guys think about the series and its finale? Do you like the fact that Akihiro is sticking around now full time as the Helverine? I for one really like it. Although, I'm not sure how the whole Project Hellfire thing is going to run now because the president was planning on shutting it down. Uh, how do we know that he's okay with the Destroyers running the show? <laughs> but as far as Dakin, though, this gives him a chance to stand out. Plus, it gives him a righteous power up for now. And if Sabretooth were around, I don't think he'd have the same success against Dakin. What do you guys think? And to all of the Dakin fans, I definitely want to hear from you guys on if you feel like they did the kid justice finally. You know I want to hear all your thoughts and theories down in the comments. And as always, if you guys enjoyed this video and this channel, and you'd like to support the channel, then you could do so by stopping by the Comics Icon store and picking you up some Comics Icon's merchandise, including the background music heard right here in this video, available for download. Or by joining the Iconic Fan Club channel membership. And there will be a link in the description to join. But with your membership, your voice will be heard during our interactive live streams with yours truly. Where we can talk about everything that's been going down in these issues. As well as ones that you'd like for me to go over in the future and other comic news. Plus you guys will get loyalty badges, member shout outs, and up to 20% off of Comics Icon's merchandise from the Comics Icon store. Plus, we've got tiers to the memberships as well beginning at just 99 cents. Or you guys can donate to the channel with a super thanks. And if you're not able to do any of that, then you can still be a tremendous help to the future of this channel by dropping a like, share, and subscribing to Comics Icons for more icons in the comic book world. But ladies and gentlemen, it's about that time. I'm out. Peace.